And uh, hello, hello, everyone. It was nice, I think, that uh, Singapore and the United States went first. Both of those jurisdictions are a little bit further advanced uh, than Canada. My name is uh, Dave Prescott. I'm a research scientist uh, from Health Canada in Ottawa, Ontario. Um, I'd just like to also just quickly point out that I don't know why everybody keeps on saying it's cold, because it's not cold. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be wearing shorts later today. Um, I also have a disclaimer, uh, much like Melanie, about how, I, as I'm a research scientist, I am not involved in the regulation or the evaluation of these products. Um, right now, I'm going to, actually, these slides are for a little bit, for something else that I'm going to speak about sort of in the next section of this, of this presentation. Uh, I'm just going to sort of, just off the cuff about the regulations in, uh, in Canada. Um, uh, I know that uh, when it comes to regulations, the precision of language is very important, so I'm going to give this disclaimer that these, what I'm saying doesn't necessarily exactly represent the, uh, the way that these foods will be regulated in Canada. Um, so uh, we're sort of, no, I wouldn't say we're behind, we don't have uh, products that have reached the market yet as compared to the, other, compared to the other jurisdictions, but we have had the regulations in our country that are there to regulate these products actually for a long time. Um, in Canada, and the advent of GMO technology, uh, the, the Food Directorate of Health Canada came up with uh, novel foods regulations that were wide and covered sort of a large enough blanket and they were widespread enough that they would cover a lot of new technologies that came on the market. Um, so in novel food regulations, there are three aspects of a new product that could trigger a new product into this novel food regulation basket. Um, one, an item that has never been used before as food. Uh, two, an item that has been used before but has been produced by a completely different process that results in the food changing in some significant aspect. Or three, uh, items that have been genetically modified in some way that results in a change in phenotype of, of, the, of the item that is going to be used as food. And there's a good chance that cellular agriculture products will, um, every product that we can envision would trigger at least one of these, probably all three of these um, in, in some cases. So they'll be regulated as novel foods and what happens with this is um, companies that want to submit a, uh, a what that we call in Canada a notification that they want to, to sell this product uh, are offered the chance to come in and uh, visit the regulators at Health Canada uh, for a pre-market consultation that can be both formal or an informal process even before that where we kind of walk them through the steps that they would need in order to produce um, a notification that we could then evaluate. Um, so this is very helpful for, for uh, some of these companies that are going to be producing cellular agriculture products because a lot of them are not familiar with the food regulatory landscape so they can come and we can say, these are the data we'd like you to show, this is what the process is, uh, and if you follow this process, uh, you know, it's the, your, your you know, easiest path towards, uh, to, for regulatory approval. Um, basically what would happen in a notification package is that we have a set of endpoints that are defined uh, based on a number of parameters such as uh, microbial contamination, chemical contamination, possibility of allergens, um, a complete description of the process, and, then, and if there are any genetic modifications, exactly the techniques that you use to do that. Um, uh, also the nutrition that, that your products that are being submitted must have uh, certain nutritional equivalency in order to be, uh, to be approved. Um, and in this package, like the endpoints are well defined, but the process by which you uh, go about them is not prescriptive, prescriptive whatsoever. So companies can prove that their product is safe in a number of ways, whether it be um, read across from other products or actual primary data, v various ways that as long as they tell a con concrete scientific story that's based in, in good science, um, that their product has, is safe, then uh, they will eventually reach what we call a uh, letter of no objection or a LONO. Uh, and in Canada, there's a time period of a 410 days from submission that uh, government regulators have a chance to look at the data to, um, to uh, go through their assurances that, that the products are safe. Um, and the, the one thing, the last thing I'd like to mention about this is it's a, the process isn't regulated, the product is regulated. So um, uh, any time that a new product is, is going to be released, it has to go through another novel foods, um, uh, novel foods process, as long as it reaches the definition of, of novelty. So you could have a product that it changes slightly and it changes slightly in a way that doesn't trigger uh, a, a novel foods um, pre-market uh, pre approval process. 
Um, but we're not regulating the process. We're regulating each individual product until possibly sometime <coughs> down the future, in, in the future, once you know the, uh, enough of enough of these products have been have been submitted, then there will be a, a you know a, a regulatory approval process for that. But our novel foods program has worked very well for for 20 some odd years now, and I, I don't necessarily envision that changing. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's the process in Canada. I don't know. Uh, I guess if we have questions for all the regulators together, we can answer them. I'm Diana Taft from University of Florida, and this is sort of an odd question because we we've heard a lot about sort of the safety of what you're adding. What about the possible effects of what you're removing? As regulators, is there something in particular you'd want to see monitored? Because I think often about how when we reduce foods to simpler components, sometimes we leave behind things that turn out to be really important for human health. And I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that and if there's a specific set of components you're at a point where, yeah, I'd love to see us monitoring this. Thank you. Uh, I guess in, in Canada, we we have uh, as part of the, the the approval process, you have a um, a nutritional equivalency. In order to be able to sell the product, you have to say that. And if so, imagining that you want to sell cultivated chicken and call it cultivated chicken, you have to be able to prove that the product you're comparing it to has similar or identical nutritional properties. And these are and like wide, these are widespread. So they'll be looking at you know carbohydrates, vitamins. Uh, amino acid profiles. Um, uh, there may be other other things that um, you know. Uh, so I guess the the other the other word that we use are, are anti nutrients. So if there's things in the new product that stop the absorbance of, of vitamins or things like that, that's another thing that they will look for uh, in in the approval process. So it's a very, I think it's an important question and a very important thing to to look for to make sure that you know the the nutritional profile is as similar as it, as it can be to the product it's trying to replicate. Yeah, if I may add as well, um, that uh, yeah, um, that's, that's right. I think uh, the nutritional profiles do have to be submitted even in Singapore. And there's always a burden of proof of equivalence to uh, uh, what, uh, what you are claiming it as. Yeah, thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, Sarah Ludmer, I'm with WK Kellogg Co. I was just really curious to understand as we're creating this process, essentially, do we know what the environmental impacts are of this new production, right? So we would assume it's going to be better, um, but are we monitoring that and are we considering that as we start to move to scale? I forgot to mention that um, in food regulations in Canada, we have, uh, you know, a number of pre-market regulations that have to be followed in a number of post-market and a number of sort of blanket regulations. Some of the pre-market that I didn't mention because it's, um, you know, it's Health Canada is part, it's part of their mandate, but it's a joint mandate with environment and climate change. When you have a novel product that enters the market, it has to go through an environmental assessment to show that your new product, whether it be the product itself or the process doesn't, it won't be environmentally damaging. Um, so that, that is something that the government will take into account. Yeah, the, the, uh, the other thing too, um, if you ever go in and look at the dossiers from both uh, Upside Foods and Good Meat, uh, they, we, we do, they did put in that uh, environmental impact piece there, even though it's not necessarily required as part of the, the uh, re review process. Um, and there certainly are a number of studies right now. Obviously, there's more projections more than anything because currently there's no big commercial facility, uh, even though currently there, there are some be, being built. Uh, but uh, th they do project, of course, that overall compared to conventional um, production of, of meat, it would be better over time. And even though maybe the first iterations might not be um, the best overall, you know, as we go forward, they'll, they'll get much more efficient and, and, and better at that. So, yes. So Connie Weaver, um, I'm on the FDA science board and one meeting about four years ago, I think it was, was devoted to uh, dealing with future concerns of cultivated meats. 
And FDA's concern, only concern at that time was uh, eventually they don't think, they don't know how to identify whether it's traditional meat or cultivated meat. And so when the price comes down, a manufacturer could just switch out whatever's the cheapest and not label it appropriately. And they don't have yet a way to detect the difference. Yeah, we, we, we still are going through the whole labeling process with, uh, with USDA and, and certainly, I don't know if they've agreed on it uh, as of yet, but I, I, my understanding is that there will be either cultivated meat or cell-based meats or, or something on there that says, that informs the, the consumer that it is uh, one or the other. Uh, but certainly, I mean, eventually I, I, I would suspect uh, that there eventually would be some sort of food fraud <laughs> at, at some point, and we have to be vigilant about that. I, I was just going to say, I would, I, I, you, building some of these, these products that are more, you know, like a, like a true tissue where you have a, you know, a scaffold that they're built upon, there will probably, I mean, in my mind, uh, like histologically or microscopically, there will probably always be at least some okay. evidence that they came from one place or another, and that would be the job. Uh, you know, in Canada, we have the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, whose job is to detect food fraud, and that would be something that they would have to come up with with protocols and, uh, and and guidelines to figure out how they how they could identify. But yeah, it could end up being you know depending on how accurate these things get to to a true tissue, it could be something that could be very very difficult to to assess. I would just add, from the the scientific standpoint, I think actually. This could be really useful in terms of the cell lag approach because you would be able to have more distinct fingerprints and traceable sort of chains of, of inputs to the process and outputs from the process. So I actually think in the long run, this will be really useful if you want to know where the origins of your particular product is at the supermarket, whether that's done through you know, entering barcodes into the cells so that you can, when you scan at the supermarket, it'll tell you exactly what the source was, as well as the ingredients, or whether it's a post-packaging uh, indication. But I, I actually think this will really help with these things in the long run. That technology is available. It hasn't been applied here yet, but it could be. Thank you. A great conversation. That, that's, you've addressed partially my quick question, and those know I gave the keynote earlier, but I have a question for David. I'm just joking. I wanted to say that <laughs> because there's so many Davids. But just for, for the panel, so when I, when I think about cellular agriculture, and as I mentioned earlier, and you just talked about uh, in immature markets, you know, opportunism will increase. But I'm more focused on if you see a risk for biosecurity, uh, on the one side. The second, when we look at geographic indicators, can somebody culture Parma ham in France rather than in Italy? And, and then we know from my colleagues at uh, University of Guelph who did the barcode of life, there were some countries, you know, South America and Africa, there are some plants and shrubs that are indigenous. They don't want them getting out of the country. So just generically, do you see any risk with biosecurity, with geographic indicators, and other indigenous products where countries will say, you know what, that's our intellectual property, and so on? The Italian thing is actually very interesting because Italy banned cultivated meat, so they would have to make far Parma ham <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> As far as the um, question about the bioterrorism, I know for a fact that FSIS has a whole food defense area, and they're definitely including this in that area of what they're investigating. And, and I might ask, like, go back to the question that was asked earlier. If, if you have you know, a, a pig that was you know, eating grain that was grown in the Parma region, will it taste different than something that's grown in the lab, like there might be, I, there's, a, there's a term for it in, in, in winemaking, the taste of, you know, where you get, you know, grow the same grape in different regions of the world and you'll get different tasting wines because the inputs, and, you know, eventually we might get to the point where technology can, can replicate every part of the flavor, but, you know, there, there, it, it might not, so apparently, you know, natural Parma ham might still be, you know, a, a, you know, an, a unique, unstealable, so to say, um, uh, uh, product. Question over here. Oh, 
it's on, sorry. <laughs> so my name's Leela Saldan, and my question sort of piggybacks on what Connie Beaver had to say and what Agostina had to say, and it's looking at it strictly from a consumer point of view. What we've not talked about so far is blended products that would be more appealing to a consumer that has the natural and what we would call a highly processed ingredient. And as we know, consumers are trying to avoid these highly processed ingredients. So the first question is, you know, in consumers who want full disclosure, you know, have you thought about labeling when you got quote unquote a natural and an added and to engage Dave in this conversation, um, you know, what kind of analytical methods or methodologies do we need in order to analyze these blended products? So just to touch on that, um, Leela, we're, I'm going to be giving just a little bit of overview of uh, AOAC's role in this area, but I think to answer the question, it's we need lots of standards and methods, um, you know, that have been done for traditional foods, as you'll find out, you know, our history is 140 years, and this has been going on, and regulators in the U.S. and around the world have relied on standards that, that we have done, so I think the same kind of... Um, long-term efforts going to have to be put into testing these new matrices and determining, you know, the same types of tests that have been done uh, for whether it's heavy metals or pesticides, et cetera, that all has to be um, determined. So it, it will take some time. And, and in terms of the consumer side of that, I'm going to give you a little bit of my other past life uh, from IFIC to give you some of, they've done some nice work on, on this too that gives us a little bit of insight. So, Yeah, no, and as far as I mean, I could be wrong here too. I mean, this is lab grown. It's fully processed. I don't think we'll ever get a, an, an organic label on that. <laughs> uh, yeah, question here. Well, this is Nandi from Ilse, India. I am having a different kind of a question because, for example, in India, we have textured meat from soya products that is called vegetarian meat or whatever. I was just wondering whether there will be any possibility in future to have this cultivated meat to be adjuncted with those kind of a product so that it can be labeled as vegetarian meat or whatever, so that this could be consumed by purely vegetarian diet preferred people. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm hesitant to re respond to questions about labeling because in Canada we don't have, we have only really started, begun uh, speaking about labeling and it, they, those, those, those questions become very difficult um, in terms of uh, what we can call, you know, vegan for instance. Um, so it's, uh, I, it, it's hard to say. Uh, I, if you're, you're um, when you ask if, I, uh, sorry, it was part of your question is if you, if there are products where you can sort of combine the, the, the you know, the yeah. vegan meat with the lab meat. And I, well, I believe those exist, right? I think, uh, yes. Yes. I think a couple of the products on the market, like one in Singapore and the one in the US are actually a combination of soy and um, uh, cultured chicken. So that, 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 that I, that those products already do exist actually. So. Yeah, so, so the one that, the, that you'll find uh, if you ever go to our San Francisco restaurant, that, that one is full 100% uh, cultivated meat. That's more of a small scale uh, type of uh, product. The large scale product that we're, that we're all working on is, uh, is really more on the suspension. Uh, it's, it's more, you'll see that more like in the, these big fermenters or cultivators, these, uh, almost like a brewery if you ever go in there. But that is a blended product with, um, uh, with plant-based material and, and cultivated meat. And again, it's, it's because of the, the scale. We just currently don't have the, the technology to make it fully 100% cultivated meat. So uh, yes, we have to use uh, plant-based in order to fill that, that uh, large percentage. Anyone else? So one one thing, and, and this is this is really coming more from a cost perspective. Uh, you know, w one of the things to submit several of these uh, dossiers, uh, startups have to spend quite a bit of money in order to do it, and each one has their own um, requirements. 
Is there any chance for harmonization or to a one world submission? Uh, do you guys talk to each other on that? <laughs> Well, I think that's um, one place where Codex can play kind of a, a good role um, in that area. As far as, I mean, when I was at FSIS, it's been three years, so there's my caveat. Um, but I would say that, yes, we do talk to our counterparts, um, obviously very much so with Canada, very close um, partners. But, you know, we have... We have partners all over the world where we're doing equivalency um, and looking at products that are going to be coming to the United States and products that are going to go out of the United States. So there's a lot of talk between countries of what we're doing. Um, so yes, those conversations are happening. Anyone else? Hi, um, thank you for sharing. This is uh, Tin Chen Lu from um, UC Taiwan. Um, safety actually is a bottom line for the consumer. When you go to the communication uh, scenario, you always can meet up with uh, technology for VR. And how safe is the safe? So, since this cultural meat is a, considered as a normal food, so it's very difficult to claim it as it is. So uh, a lot of concern about the, the growth factor, uh, hormone, and uh, how is any guideline or uh, come up with the um, formulation can go to this uh, communication tool for the, the consumer. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, maybe um, I'll just share a little. I, uh, from, from the Singapore perspective, actually, I think uh, in, in our documents as well, uh, any of these um, added components uh, need to be removed and there must be proof that the uh, of its removal. So uh, it is very likely that, um, I, I'm not the one running the test as I've shared, but uh, very likely that uh, there will be some tests to ensure that these uh, do not follow through into the product. Yeah, one, one of the things also with uh, growth factors and everything that we put into, into the product itself, um, and, and I'm going to refer to a, a report that just came out, uh, well, it came out last year from FAO uh, that, that talks about all the different types of hazards that could uh, occur. But uh, speaking specifically of, of growth factors in, in itself and, and anything else, once you, in, in the whole process, once you remove the cells from, from the bioreactors or from their uh, micronutrient environment, they, they really start to become inactive. Um, and then going through the, 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 the typical process of, of, uh, of any meat facility with the, the cold storage, the, 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 the harvesting, um, and then finally, of course, the, the, the actual cooking, the thermal in itself, for anything to survive there, it would just be incredible <laughs> you know for, for a cell to survive all of that storage and handling it, it just it just won't uh, and if anything if there were to be any sort of growth hormone residues on there uh, just the gut in itself with its uh, lower pH and its gastric enzymes with pepsin and so forth that will take care of it itself so overall the 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 just the overall risk of any sort of uh, uh, growth factors there, or even the, the hazard of genetic drift, uh, uh, it, 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 it just will not happen. It, it'll, uh, it's, it's funny, in, the, in that FAA report, they said um, something along, along the lines of, uh, for something to, for this hazard to occur, it is scientifically impossible, or it, <laughs> some, somewhere along those lines, but it, for it to occur, it's just very, very low. Yeah, I, I would add one other, one other point that 
uh, kind of an un unintended consequence on the good side here is everyone's working to minimize you know, the growth factors and hormones you need because okay. those are the costly ingredients. So you're already starting from a fairly low level. You're trying to add only what you absolutely have to. So you know, worrying about the downstream residuals becomes hopefully less and less of a problem because of the process people are trying to develop. One more question before we go to Dave. Does oh, anybody? Alan Bibbis and Peter College London. I just wanted to comment on that last response about um, the growth factors um, and reflect on the history of this issue. So if we think about where we were on GMOs at the very beginning, a lot of scientists were saying there is certain aspects we just don't need to worry about because it's inconceivable there'd be a problem. And that was the reality. But the public reaction that subsequently came on meant there was a huge backlash and a, we're, still suffer, we're still suffering from it. So I'm just urging, um, don't take things for granted, even if you know they're scientifically very, very probable. You need to generate the data to demonstrate to the skeptic that what you're saying is actually the, the truth. So I've been involved in discussions on things like what's the risk of IGF-1 in trace amounts, and we use the same argument, it's inconceivable it would survive the gut. We still had to go through the measurements and the demonstration that actually nothing's getting through to cause a health effect in the, expo in the consumer. So it's just about building the database in advance to protect against the argument that there's a consumer risk. 